GlaxoSmithKline's CEO Andrew Witte writing a guest blog on CNBC.com today on breaking down the barriers to access to health care. Joining us exclusively from London to talk about that and much more is Mr. Witte. Welcome to Power Lunch, sir. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks very much, Sue. It's a pleasure to be with you. Your company was just rated number one on the Access to Medicine Index because of your efforts to expand access to medications to parts of Asia and parts of Africa, those places you also spent a lot of your career in. But a lot of investors are wondering how you continue to expand access to medicines by either discounting or by donating them and maintain profitability for the company as well. I think it's really a challenge of how we do both. How do we develop our business all around the world in our established markets as well as emerging economies, but also make sure we don't forget those people who unfortunately have really no economic means to access the healthcare system, for example, in the 60 least developed countries of the world. We're trying to strike that balance, and I think uh, the progress we're making, I'm very pleased with, I was delighted with the results of the Access to Medicine Index. And what it shows is that some of the approaches we're taking are really working. It's really making a difference it's allowing us to get medicines to people in Africa and elsewhere who otherwise are, uh, would not have access to those uh, drugs and technologies. And at the same time, I think we're also being able to demonstrate over the last couple of years, we've been able to make the kind of changes that were necessary to be more competitive in the Western mm -hmm. markets as well. Mr. Woody, it's Michelle here, and I applaud you for your work in the 60 least developed countries in the world. When I look at the situation, though, I see Japan, Europe, Canada, they all insist on having very cheap drugs as well. They all have some form of price controls, which means that essentially Americans end up footing the bill, the R&D bill, for companies like yours. When's the industry going to take a stand against this other aspect of your business, which to me seems very unjust? Why does Japan deserve cheap drugs just like Africa? Well, well, actually, around the world, you see very different drug prices according to the different systems that we operate in. Japan happens to be one of the higher drug price markets, actually relatively similar to the U.S. on many medicines. You're quite right, though. In a number of European countries, we see a lower level of drug pricing. Uh, we're not happy about that. We spend a lot of time trying to negotiate with those governments, but unlike the U.S., you see governments which have essentially 100 percent of uh, health care uh, resources at their disposal. There is no choice in those markets for patients. And oftentimes what we see attendant with lower drug prices are delays to access to new medicines and a delay to access to innovative new medicines. Now, I think what we see here in the U.S. is some very different priorities, a real emphasis on innovation, on speed to access, and on giving people choices. Having said all of that, I think it's also only fair to, fair to say that in the U.S. marketplace, I would say there are some extremely uh, sharp procurement skills uh, being deployed both in the private sector and by the government, uh, and we do see significant discounts being charged in the U.S. marketplace as well uh, by different types of customers. So I'd say across the world, price is always uh, a sharply contested mm -hmm. issue. There are differences, but those differences are often to do with the fundamental system. Mr. Woody, um, you, were, you were talking about the fact that you uh, feel as though you're being, you were able to compete effectively here in, in the United States and in the Western world um, as you continue to do the philanthropic work in the still developing world. But how have you done that? You've changed the product mix to a certain extent at GlaxoSmithKline, which has helped your bottom line in the developed world, has it not? That's right. What we've been trying to do over the last couple of years is really evolve this business from being one which was really dominated by a few uh, pharmaceutical medicines to being a business which is much more diversified and can then deliver more sustainable sales and earnings growth. We've done that by allocating capital much more evenly into our consumer healthcare business, for example, a business that markets products like Sensodyne in the U.S., uh, Panadol internationally and other uh, well-known consumer products also investing in our vaccine business which has been a particularly strong growth business for us over the last several years and making sure that we invest in the emerging economies uh, so not the least developed but those up and coming emerging economies of the world places like India and China mm -hmm. and we've seen as a consequence of that uh, our business generally been a much more balanced business mm -hmm. it's given us more growth and it's allowed us to then refocus what we're doing in Europe and America to make sure that the way we compete in those markets is ready for what we believe will be the new marketplace of the West 
a much a marketplace which seeks much more evidence of value for money and that's what we're really trying to make sure we're ready to deal with. I'm still trying to get my mind around a fact in one of the in the research that you sell. What is it? 900, uh, 9 billion Tums tablets every year. That's just a <laughs> staggering thought. I probably eaten 8 billion of them at one time or other. But, but at any rate, Mr. Woody, I want to ask you seriously about health care reform in the United States. Does it help you? Does it hurt you? Is it a non-event for you? Uh, well, it's certainly not a non-event. I think healthcare reform is a very major change for you know, literally hundreds of institutions and thousands and millions of individuals in the U.S. I think it was, imp I think it was, imp it's an important piece of legislative change. As far as it affecting the industry is concerned, there are some short-term impacts. There's no doubt at all. This has a negative impact on price in the short run in the U.S. Uh, what it also does, of course, in the longer term is potentially open up some greater volume. We have to wait and see. It depends exactly on how the coverage extensions take place. Uh, and then I think downstream, uh, something to keep an eye on is uh, the development of the comparative effectiveness agenda, mm. uh, which I think over the next decade will be something that we, we will be keeping a careful eye on. It will be very important that we're able to engage with that process properly uh, to make sure the right uh, conclusions are made for everybody here in the U.S. And, and so I, I think this is an important piece of legislation. It was clearly important that something mm -hmm. started to be addressed in terms of controlling overall health care cost. Uh, my guess is that, that over time, it will take a while for us okay, to really yes. all understand what the downstream consequences of this bill are. Mr. Witte, thank you. Appreciate your joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you.